Okay, and then we'll move on to the lunch program. Um, again, thank you to our, our generous partners from Ogden Clinic, National Kidney Foundation, Utah Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, again, this is a great tradition that we've created here, um, and those guys help us sustain it. The um, next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz. Um, his talk is sponsored by the Utah Academy of Family Physicians. It is entitled, The Willful Direction of Consciousness in Medical Practice. It has something to do with the brain. I don't know how much. Um, Dr. Schwartz is an American psychiatrist and researcher in the field of neuroplasticity and its application to obsessive compulsive disorder, which we all have. Dr. Schwartz received a bachelor's with honors in philosophy and then pursued a career in the medical sciences. He is currently an associate research professor of psychiatry at UCLA and a fellow of the International Society for Complexity, Information, and Design. Dr. Schwartz is also the overseas ambassador or patron for the UK's National Obsessive Compulsive Disorder Charity, OCD-UK. Dr. Schwartz is a researcher in the field of self-directed neuroplasticity. He is the author of almost 100 scientific uh, publications in the fields of neuroscience and psychiatry and several popular books. His major research interests over the past two decades have been brain imaging, functional neuroanatomical and cognitive behavioral therapy with a focus on the pathological mechanisms and psychological treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. He is the author of several books, most recently, You Are Not Your Brain, The Four Steps uh, Solution for Ending Destructive Behavior, Changing Bad Habits, and Taking Control of Your Life. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here in Ogden, where there are mountains you can see, as opposed to the ones where in Los Angeles, a couple of days a year we can see them, but here we can see them a lot. So that's nice. Um, so yes, there's going to be maybe not a lot about the brain, but there's going to be something about the brain. And I think one of the questions that is interesting is why would somebody who's going to be telling you about the brain write a book called You Are Not Your Brain. And then I'm really happy to see that tomorrow, I do not know um, Dr. Glannon or Professor Glannon, um, but I guess there's gonna be a talk tomorrow that also is friendly to that perspective. So I think it's, I think one of the main things that I wanna accomplish in this presentation is to show why that makes a lot of sense even for any physician who cares a lot about physiology, cares a lot about proper use of pharmaceutical agents, cares a lot about biological approaches to medicine, and yes, even cares about new frontiers in molecular medicine. All, none of that requires that you view the person as a piece of biology. And, that, and that's one of the main points that I want to really make in this presentation is that all of our biological knowledge, while extremely important, any which way you, you um, put them together, view them, it never adds up to a person. Biological information is not a person. People critically need proper functioning and balance of biological factors to be fully functional people, but they're more than that. And so that is, in some ways, that's the take home message and that's the case that I want to make for you today. So one way of approaching this, which I happen to have a lot of experience in, is this interface which something, with something that was really off the radar when I started doing it 40 years ago, and now is like the new fad. So this word mindfulness is a pretty interesting thing, and it's become like so popular. And I think it's really a good time for physicians to become aware of a proper understanding of what it is, what it has to do with the brain, and why it really does have significant relevance um, not just in mental health disorders, although it certainly has relevance in mental health disorders, and I am a research 
psychiatrist at UCLA for over 30 years, um, but also, I think, very much has applicability to general medical practice. And I'm just going to use obsessive compulsive disorder as sort of a model. So this is it's not a lecture on obsessive compulsive disorder, but I think obsessive compulsive disorder, which I have been working on also for 30 years, um, makes a pretty good paradigm for medical application of mindfulness. So I wrote a book, You Are Not Your Brain, and part, like, like I say, partly what I want to do is explain why a person who has spent their whole life in neuroscience is up here saying, you are not your brain. Because I have spent my whole life in neuroscience. And so this um, mock-up picture here that I took from the very eminent uh, Dutch artist M.C. Escher, and you've probably all seen it before. Um, we live in an era now where the mind, to, to an extent that I believe has become excessive, is, is viewed as a product of the brain. And, you know, I will not deny for one second that elite opinion in our era, um, you, can, you can get up at essentially any um, academic medical meeting in this country or in Western Europe and say assertively um, with even more than a touch of arrogance, to be really, you know, candid about it, that the mind is nothing more than what the brain does, and no one will bat an eye. And yet that's a highly ideological statement, and I think it's a highly ideological statement that is false. So one of the ways that I think we can get reoriented, because that kind of a perspective is new and is itself very faddish, even though it's become faddish among very elite people. One of, the, one of the ways I think we can get back to a balance here is by viewing the mind not as some kind of fuzzy, fluffy, mystical thing that sort of follows us around up in the sky, but the, I think you can make a very strong case that scientifically we can study the mind by just basically defining it for purposes of medical research as the choices and decisions that people make about what to do with what, what to do with the information that is delivered to us by our nervous system and by our, you know, so, you know, our somatic existence. So you can see that in no way am I downplaying the importance of biology, far from it. I, I do not deny for a second that biology and more specifically the nervous system and more specifically the brain are absolutely integral for delivering essentially all or close to all of our conscious experience to us and even as well a lot of our unconscious experience. So, we all are to some very, very real and very, very significant degree biological beings. However, what makes us uniquely human and what makes us people are the choices and decisions that we make about what to do with that biological reality and what aspects of it, and here we're gonna really get up to the key sort of thrust of the presentation, what aspects of that reality to focus attention on? What should we pay attention to and what should we not pay so much attention to? What parts of our experience should we allow to push us to action? What parts of our experience should we make decisions to refrain from acting on? I mean, I don't think I need to elaborate, especially in front of an audience of, of practicing clinical physicians how important it is we communicate to our patients that refraining from actions on a lot of our desires, impulses, compulsions um, is very important for physical and mental health. And so one of the things that 
I really like to stress is how do we get people to do that better? And that's really mostly what this talk is about. And it begins, I think you can pretty quickly see why obsessive compulsive disorder was a pretty good model for studying that because obsessive compulsive disorder is a condition which is reasonably well understood. I mean, from a brain biology perspective, it's actually as well understood as any other neuropsychiatric condition. And I'm going to show you some of the you know, now very old data that I was involved in collecting in the 80s that, and this doesn't happen all that often in psychiatry, that even 30 years later is still basically the model. I mean, um, so this is highly, 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 highly reproduced data now. And this model that I'm presenting, that at, UC, that at UCLA in the 80s we were integral in putting together, is now the working model for how the neurophysiology of obsessive compulsive disorder is understood, basically as a corticostriatal disorder. Um, but the key to treating that disorder, yes, there's pharmacologic treatment. I'm all for using pharmacologic treatment appropriately. But what do I mean by using pharmacologic treatment appropriately? Something very specific. I mean using pharmacologic treatment to enable people to empower people to make wiser choices and decisions about what aspects of the things their brain is delivering to them to act on. Now, if you have obsessive compulsive disorder, a hallmark of that disorder based on genetically, uh, genetically inherited diathesis, I mean, this is now, you know, this is not controversial. I mean, this is a genetically inherited corticostriate disease. It's actually in many ways closer to a neurological disease than a psychiatric disease per se, as that is truly, you know, traditionally understood. And so obsessive compulsive disorder is genuinely a neuropsychiatric condition and a reasonably well understood one at that. Um, and the hallmark of that, of that disorder is that people get bothersome, intrusive, very viscerally experienced urges and impulses tied in most commonly to the feeling that things are dirty and need to be washed and washed and washed again and again because of tremendous fears of contamination and, and or things need to be checked and checked and checked again and again because of feelings of danger. Now they rationally know that that doesn't make sense. And that's another hallmark of making the diagnosis. I mean, if, if you can't get a reasonable history, either from the person or their close um, significant others, that this person has in the past demonstrated an awareness that these thoughts are excessive, the diagnosis is very much called into question. So you're dealing with people who basically know that the actions that they're doing don't make a whole lot of sense, and yet they have a very hard time not doing it because why? Because the brain is delivering this constant barrage of very bothersome feelings um, that cause them to feel like things are contaminated, things are dirty, they need to be washed again, they need to be checked again, even though if you ask them, do you really believe that? They go, not really, but I just can't stop doing it. And, and there's, there's, there are complicated reasons about why that happens, a lot of which have to do with basically the behavioral physiology of the basal ganglia. And that would be a whole other talk. Um, but what I want to stress in this talk is that this mindfulness going back to the 80s is something that I've been using now for 30 full years at UCLA to help people with this disorder to refrain from acting in this pathological manner. And if, of course, you know, the major sort of achievement that our group had was showing that this caused changes in that very specific corticostriate circuit in the brain that correlated with improvements in obsessive compulsive disorder um, symptomatology. So what is mindfulness? So I, I mean, I hope in that little intro there, I, I managed to kind of capture your attention enough so you're going to go, hmm, this might be medically relevant. It's medically relevant. So what is this um, mindful awareness? Well, it's an activity. It's something we do with how we focus our attention. Now, it's a, it's a kind of a state of mind, and in a few minutes, we're all going to be practicing it. At least the people in the room who are cooperative are going to be practicing it. And, and um, so that's a decision you're going to get to make, too. So it's a state of mind that people can learn how to do and what is that state of mind? Okay, so in the most straightforward of terms, 
What that state of mind is, is a state of mind in which you actually develop the skill to observe your own conscious experience and make rational decisions about it. So what mindfulness basically is, an, is an observational skill. And in that way, it's not, it's not entirely um, dissociated from the observational skill that we phys as physicians use when we interact with our patients, except now we're the patient. I mean, so, so mindfulness is very, very integrally involved in the ancient Greek maxim, physician heal thyself. I mean, you're actually learning how to be your own physician in some very meaningful way. You're learning how to observe what's going on in your conscious experience, in your mind, meaning the decisions and choices you make about what you pay attention to. So a lot of what mindfulness is, is paying attention to what you're paying attention to. And that's a skill. It's a skill that you don't just do. It's a skill that you have to sort of learn to do, but as you learn to do it, it becomes more automatic. And I like to say that it actually gets wired into your basal ganglia. It gets wired into your habit brain so that you now habitually start paying attention in new, different, more adaptive ways. So it's a kind of an awareness. It's, it's a kind of awareness that has to do with what is happening right now. Now that statement has gotten completely blown out of context in the lay media. And, and I don't even, even want to start. I mean, there was an article in the Financial Times yesterday the Financial Times yesterday about why mindfulness is no good because business people have to pay attention to more than what's happening right now. And as a person who's been um, involved in this for 40 full years, this is very frustrating because it, it shows that this pop understanding has now penetrated because, I mean, if, if you don't know, I mean, Google you know, brings in these mindfulness experts into their headquarters in Mountain View, California. They have, you know, thousands of employees being taught this. Of course, the financial press was very interested in that. It spread like topsy because it's Google. And that, you know, and this is part of the way it became the fad that it currently is. But there's a lot more to mindfulness than paying attention just to what's happening right now. Real mindfulness, as opposed to pop fad mindfulness, is paying attention to what's happening right now and making intelligent decisions about what to do about it. That part they kind of play down in the New Age pop application. Because that means you need self-discipline. That need, means you need wisdom. That means you need a term that has become very important in my way of applying this, what I call a wise advocate and much more about that in a few moments. So it's a way of focusing attention, it's a way of consciously directing your attention, and then this very important word of acceptance. Acceptance of what exactly? Well, it's primarily the acceptance of the fact that it's hard to control your attention. Um, I mean, obviously, to anybody who's been through med medical school, it's not a hard case to make that it's hard to control your attention. I mean, um, we all remember things that we would have rather been doing than the things we were doing nine hours before our anatomy exam. Um, so, you know, getting that stuff into your mind, memorizing stuff, learning what you need to know to be a physician takes a lot of acceptance of the fact that I have to direct my attention on something that I'd rather not be doing right now. That's the kind of acceptance that mindfulness really makes us better at. Mindfulness makes us better at accepting the fact that our attention is not easy to control. And it makes us more, it makes us more aware of the things that um, takes our attention away from where we rightfully know it should be. So that kind of acceptance actually gives us a kind of cognitive flexibility, cognitive flexibility being something that's strongly wired into the prefrontal executive brain, and that's why mindfulness practice has now been so well demonstrated in many um, brain imaging studies to enhance the 
efficacy of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of the executive brain, and, and even more specifically, of this um, cognitive flexibility concept. So one of the reasons that mindfulness has become as important as it has in the practice of medicine is because there's now such a strong database for enhancement of frontal cortex executive function by the practice of the kind of exercises that I'm going to show you in just a couple of moments. Okay, so the components of mindfulness are direct knowing and deep experiential awareness, being knowledgeable about what's happening in this moment as it's happening, but not merely just to be like superficially knowledgeable, to be knowledgeable in a way that brings this wise advocate function into play so you can make better judgments about what's happening in this moment, better assessments, better discernments. So those are two very important words that are intimately linked to real mindfulness in the classical tradition out of which it came. Discernment, assessment. Approaching your experience and feelings through a direct observation rather than through thoughts and concepts that cloud our perceptions. And that itself is a pretty big subject. And you know, for the mental health people here, we all know that when you get to really know how people understand their experience, all people, we all have a lot of thoughts and concepts that cloud our perceptions of what's actually going on. So mindfulness helps us slowly disentangle ourselves from that and again, empowers us to make more rational decisions about how to respond to what's actually happening in real time. A lifelong task, a lifelong task which you see gradual improvement in as you apply this. So th these are the brain images for which are now, you know, history of brain imaging pictures more than anything having to do with current data. But I mean, this is, this is work that I was involved in in the 80s. And basically, this is the bottom of the front of the brain, the so-called orbitofrontal cortex. It sits right over the eye orbits. And it's, it's an area of the brain that a lot of work had gone on. When this was originally discovered in the 80s, this area was, had mostly just been um, researched in primates. It was not an easy area to research in the pre-brain imaging era in humans because it's not very accessible. And, and, um, but with, with brain imaging, it's quite accessible. So, so, um, so this area of the brain we now know has a lot to do with essentially making approach avoidance assessments about things in um, our immediate sensory sphere, at least in primate research, that jumps right out. I mean, um, when a monkey is exposed to something that it's been negatively reinforced about, this area of the brain becomes very active. And, and analogously, when things that the animal is attracted to um, are put in its sensory sphere, this area also becomes active. And this area has now become, not surprisingly, based on that statement, a prime area of research in the, in the, in the new and reasonably well-flourishing area of neuroeconomics, which is one of these kind of spin-off areas that is kind of coming along, you know, kind of understanding economics in terms of how, what the brain does. And the orbital frontal cortex is one of the key areas that they study in that. Now, there's another area here, too, that's, that I've also been mentioning, the striatum. So that's the head of the caudate nucleus in a coronal picture, in, an, in a coronal view. And, and so there, when I say corticostriatal, there's a very robust projection from the entire frontal cortex in, into, the, into the head of the caudate nucleus. I mean, the head of the caudate nucleus is, is, ba is basically receiving um, input from the entire frontal cortex and basically is a, I mean, I think a, a reasonable sort of working understanding of what the basal ganglia does. I mean, obviously, we know from 19th century neurology that it has a lot to do with automaticity and automatic behaviors. And of course, we know that when people lose the dopamine um, innervation of it in Parkinson's disease, you know, putting automatic behaviors together smoothly is markedly impaired. Um, and the head of the caudate nucleus, a lot of what we call behavioral habit formation occurs, um, especially cognitive habits. I mean, the putamen is, is more 
has the analogous function for the more som somatic parts of the brain. But, but one of the big advances, I would say, that occurred when I was sort of a young researcher um, it, that was happening in the 60s, the 70s, and by the 80s had really become part of sort of the doctrine of neuroscience was, was that there were parts of the basal ganglia, of which the head of the cardiac nucleus is a key one, um, that had a lot to do with, with cognitive habits and with emotional habits. So there, there's a so-called affective component to the basal ganglia, which is more on the ventral side and more on the rostral anterior part. And so the head of the cardiac nucleus has to do with habit formation in, in sort of the most simplest way of putting it. And it makes a lot of sense that this frontal cortex, the head of cardiac nucleus, is where you, where you have the main pathophysiological disturbance in obsessive compulsive disorder, because basically what happens is that, and, and this is where the name of my first book, Brain Lock, comes from. You basically get a brain lock, that, that, the, that the part of the orbital frontal cortex that is related to the feeling that something is wrong gets locked in place, and, and so that even though the person basically knows, hey, there's nothing wrong anymore, the feelings keep coming in and in and in, and this area becomes very overactive because of this problem. So this problem has, I, as I'm pointing out, has now a reasonably well understood, especially for a psychiatric illness, um, pathophysiology associated with it. And, and so this was starting to come clear in the 80s, not least of which because of this very research that I'm showing you here. And, and this picture actually, to show you kind of fast forwarding, this picture I actually um, got from the November 2013 issue of Discover Magazine in which they kind of nicely wrote an article about this work. And then there's even an associated ebook about my role in it um, that Discover Magazine published. And so I guess I'm just making the point here that, that I have absolutely didn't write, have nothing to do with, and, and so I'm just like pointing that out to make the point that between sort of early 80s, mid 80s, and 2013, you know, they're still writing about this very work in, in Discover Magazine and other places too, and it's referenced a lot. So this is just a picture that was from that article, which is easy to find if you just Google my name and Discover Magazine and OCD, it comes up right up. And, and so here you see the orbital frontal cortex down there, the head of the cardiac nucleus here, there's this direct monosynaptic projection there, and that is really, it's, it's, it's a malfunction in that circuit that underlies these constant, bothersome, intrusive thoughts and urges that people get in obsessive compulsive disorder. So in the 90s, yes, we treated it with medication, and of course it still largely is treated with medication, but in the 90s we showed that that circuit changes when you just use drug-free self-treatment methods based, that were based on mindfulness, because I've been doing mindfulness for 40 years, and so in the 80s, I kind of said, gee, I bet we can maybe use mindfulness to help these people, and it might well change the brain, and now we have brain imaging at UCLA, let's give it a try, and it worked. So I had a career in academic medicine, whoopee. So, okay. Um, that's kind of how these things happen. Back then, you didn't even really have to politicize nearly as much as you do now, but you still did. But just achievements worked more then. OK, enough editorializing for today, um, at least on that subject. So when I started to um, say, OK, we've done this for obsessive compulsive disorder. This, this is interesting, and I still do do it for obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, I still have a, you know, a group at OC, a, a group of pro bono group has been meeting for 27 years at UCLA, OCD education group. But I mean, about 10 years ago and more, I started to say, look, I'd like to start applying this in non-pathological situations. So now I'm going to start like kind of more stressing that aspect of it because, because I mean, this way of thinking really does have strong application 
in non-pathological situations. So instead of taking a disease state and showing that you can change the brain in it and get significant symptom improvement, which we, you know, which we did, I mean, now I'm saying, well, let's take normal people and sort of make them um, even more functional and or use this kind of reasoning in a preventative medicine kind of a way, I mean, so that you can prevent the illness rather than treating the illness. So, so this, this very um, kind of circuitry and just and a lot more than just that circuitry, but there's no question that the striatum, because of its habit-forming aspects, is very, very integral in a term we coined, which basically, though, was very much derived from the cognitive therapy literature called deceptive brain messages, which is very associated to the cognitive therapy term that goes you know, back to the 80s and before, called cognitive distortions. So deceptive brain messages are basically cognitive distortions. They're, they're false and accurate thoughts, unhelpful, distracting impulses, urges, desires, that takes us away from goals and intentions in life, true self. Okay, so um, even though they have been very generous in the amount of time they've given me in this talk, I can't start saying all, why I made all these decisions to bring concepts like true self and wise advocate into, into it. But, but um, I did, and the, the reason why I did, in a nutshell, is because pretty early on, I started to see that, look, if you really want to communicate with people about things they need to do that they kind of don't really want to do, because there's a lot of biological sort of drives that sort of are pushing them away from doing it. Um, it's good if you have concepts that are embedded in value systems that people can sort of relate to, integrate, that they can refer back to, you know, at those critical moments when they're trying to sort of, you know, not smoke the next cigarette, not eat the next donut, not take the next drink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I don't have any qualms, problems, issues with supplementing this kind of approach with you know, biological amplification, but I do have a problem, a significant problem. In fact, I'm opposed to trying to view those problems as nothing but biological issues. And because, because when you take that kind of materialist perspective on it, you end up basically saying, well, what we need to treat drug abuse is another drug. So let's all put billions of dollars into research on the drugs that are going to treat drug abuse. And not only doesn't it work very well, I don't think it's ever going to work very well. And I think that, I think that one of the things that's happening now that is sort of a bit of a positive spin is the term translational medicine, um, look, you know, a lot of lip service and grants to quote-unquote translational medicine where, let's be honest, the culture of academic medicine is not very translational. So, but at least, you know, at least you say the words, you know, get the puppets, you know, get the puppets to repeat the words before you give them the money. So there's a lot of that that's going on. And, and um, I think that th this issue of really thinking about, well, how are we going to use this has an, let's, and I'm, I'm leading up in this particular case to just making a demonstration of how 12-step programs, which I have absolutely no personal involvement in whatsoever other than having, you know, quite a few clinical, you know, people coming who are part of 12-step programs. I mean, but 12-step programs, I mean, 10 years ago, NIDA, they did not, they did not want to talk about 12-step programs. I mean, 12-step programs was considered sort of unsophisticated. You know, our goal is to make a world where they don't need 12-step programs. That was kind of sort of the unspoken and not sometimes even unspoken message. Um, you know, because of our great advances in molecular biology, we're not even going to need 12-step programs anymore. Ha ha. Well, we all know that we still really need 12-step programs, and, and we're going to for the indefinite future. And, and, and so 
This issue of having a higher power, having you know, a group dynamic, having a sense of belonging, having a value system, having you know, things that people can refer to in real time, in their real lives, in the real world that help them resist these urges is very important. So I bring in co concepts like forming a true self and using your wise advocate to enhance people's desire and capacity to do that. Now, this, this is very, very new work that was done um, at Emory University by a researcher, a young researcher by the name of Wendy Hassenkamp. She's a, the first author of it, and it, it's basically her work. And her, her collaborator um, and the senior author was um, a person named Larry Barcelou at Emory University. She's actually now the scientific director of the Mind Life Foundation. I, I, and, and I actually got this picture out of a paper that was published in the Public Library of Science that is really a summary of work that was published in 2012 in Neuroimage, which is really the, basically the top neuroimaging journal. And um, she's been very kind to give me her slides, and it's really nice, but in the end, the one I'm really showing is one that I just kind of got out of one of her publications. But, but the reason why um, I think this work is so important is, because, is for two reasons. Um, we're going to do the exercise that she used to collect this data in an fMRI scan as soon as I explain this to you. So I'm using this as a lead-in to an exercise that we're actually going to do. In a, in a few minutes from now. It's a breathing exercise. It's a breathing awareness exercise. And basically, what she did in this extremely clever study is take experienced meditators, and one of the reasons why this work is very interesting is because it builds on a body of research that I've kind of mentioned over the last sort of 10 to 15 years of you know, the brain discoveries that have been made from doing this mindfulness practice. Now, no question about it. It's now a very large literature, and you know, some of it's very good, and some of it is, like any large literature, not as good. But, but she's a practitioner in this, as, as I am. And, and so she made some, I think, very sort of um, wise choices about how to do this study because she knew like what she was actually doing. Um, and what she did was say, okay, we're going to have people focus attention on their breathing, which you're going to get to do in a minute. I, I, I had to make the decision whether to show this data before or after doing the exercise, and I'm still kind of, we'll see how we respond here, and maybe I should do it after. But I'm doing it before so you know that this really has big effects on your brain. So you're taking people who have a lot of experience, um, at least several hundred hours, and, and a fair number of them, several thousand hours. And just like, you know, full disclosure, I have well over 10,000 hours of doing this very exercise um, experience. So this is a very traditional practice of, that you're going to get to do in a minute um, of being aware of in and out breathing. And what she did was tell people when you become aware of the fact that your mind is no longer on your breath, press, press a button, which gives a signal. So these people are now doing this breathing awareness exercise, which they have a lot of experience doing, in an fMRI scanner. And what she basically then did was, it was a very good guess. She, she said, well, let's just say that when they became aware of the fact that their mind had wandered, three seconds before that, their mind was actually wandering. And then since they're trying to do this practice, they know that once you become aware of the fact that your mind has wandered, MW is mind wandering, aware means aware that your mind has wandered, then three seconds after that, they're going to have be shifting their attention back to the breath. And when they shift their attention back to the breath, three seconds after that, let's just say, now we'll say for working purposes, we're going to test the hypothesis that now they're focusing on their breath. And that, it worked like a charm, because the brain areas that she elaborated by doing that line up extremely well with a massive body of functional neuroimage literature, most of it um, collected in completely non-mindfulness contexts that get into 
what are now recognized to be very um, well-described basic neural patterns that basically align with these kinds of mental states. So I'm just going to review that briefly right now. Mind wandering. Mind wandering is now aligned with a part, a system in the brain called the default mode network, the so-called DMN. And there is a massive literature on this. Um, and this is, this is a term that was coined by Marcus Rakel, who was really one of the founders of brain imaging at Washington University in St. Louis about 15 years ago. <clears throat> and basically, the, the default mode network contains more structures than the ones just labeled here, but these are actually the key structures in it. The, this, here you see in a horizontal view the right and left posterior sing cingulate cortex. Here, you know, posterior cingulate cortex. And here you see the very, very important ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Why is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex very, very important? The ventral medial prefrontal cortex turns out to be very, very important because there is now a very, also a very large body of data supporting the view that when people think about themselves, they activate, this area gets activated. So this whole issue of self-relevant information and the role of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in discerning information as relevant to me. And I've actually coined a name for this area for lay people, the it's about me area of the brain. Because it really is actually involved in making the discernment, hey, this is about me. This matters to me. And it turns out that the um, posterior cingular cortex and this anterior cingular cortex, so basically over here and over here, are very closely connected. And one very good description of the function there, I like this because it's coming from such a world-leading authority. The world-leading authority on the cingulate cortex, and that's actually, I don't even know this guy, so it's like completely non-personal, but I've certainly known about him for you know, over 30 years. And his name is Brent Vogt, and nobody in neuroscience would deny that he is the guy in uh, cingulate cortex research. And when he was writing about this anterior-posterior cingulate cortex um, connectivity in one of the many neuroanatomical papers he's written about this system, he said that these structures are involved in self-reflection and egocentric orientation in relation to faces and words with particular and um, personal meanings. So there it is. I mean, that's just like nice medical language for, hey, it's about me. This is relevant to me. What I'm seeing there is relevant to me and what I'm interested in. So it's not uninteresting that there's an area of the brain that's so like connected in to that kind of an experience. But wait, there's more. It's mind wandering. It's the part of the brain that gets, that gets activated when your mind wanders. Now, this is pretty interesting if you think about it. I mean, I guess you didn't have to have a whole lot of neurophysiological research and neuroanatomical investigation to come up with the insight that when your mind wanders, you're usually thinking about yourself. But there you have it. Um, scientifically uh, validated now, so you can really believe it. So what this means is that when people are starting to try to pay attention to their breathing, which you're about to do in a couple of minutes here, and your mind wanders, you will notice yourself that the way your mind wanders is very, very, very usually concerning stuff that has to do with you. So this dorsal, this so-called default mode network, and that, word, that term comes from just putting people in a scanner and doing nothing at all. I mean, Rake, that was an insight that Rakel had. I mean, usually when you put people in a scanner, it's like very expensive. So you figure we're putting them in the scanner, we should do something, right? So there's all kinds of functional tests that they do. And then what does the brain do in this test and this test and this test? Well, I mean, Rakel had the funding and the experience and everything. And he had the insight, like, let's just put people in there and just not have them do anything. And this is, that's how the default mode network was discovered and named. Because it's what happens when you just put people on a scanner and say, lie there. 
And, and then th that area of the brain basically was subsequently now investigated and, and discovered to be involved in self-related ideation. So it's kind of an interesting connectivity there. So what happens now when you become aware? So your mind is wandering, but it's when they become aware that their mind has wandered. So, uh, you know, imagine now, as you're going to get real-world experience of very soon, you're trying to pay attention to in and out breathing. As you're going to see, even doing that for two minutes without your mind wandering is not easy. And so now you have experienced people becoming aware of when their mind has wandered. And a comp so the, 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 the big message here is that the brain system involved shifts, shifts. And what does it shift to? It shifts to different set of structures, the right and left bilateral anterior insular cortex and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. So the insular cortex is its, is, is its own big story. Um, this is an area of the brain that has traditionally been called the viscerosomatic region. Viscerosomatic region means, you know, you, you're aware of your gut level feelings. So, so, so the, the, the insular cortex, which is now very intensively investigated itself, is involved in awareness of gut level feelings, sensations, okay? A couple of years ago, this system was kind of renamed as the salience network. So salience network basically is going, oh, well, that's something to pay attention to. That's something to pay attention to. And, and so again, it's not surprising that she sees, that Hassenkamp sees this area become activated when people become aware that their mind was wandering. But it's the point I'm trying to make here is that when you become aware, you've sh you're now shifting neural circuitry. You're shifting from the default mode network to the salience network. Because like you're going, hey, the fact that my mind has wandered is something that I want to pay attention to now. Because it's important, because I'm supposed to be doing something and my mind has wandered. Now, needless to say, this is beginning to show you why mindfulness is important. Because mindfulness is important because it makes you more aware more quickly when you're not paying attention to what you're supposed to be paying attention to, which is directly correlated with increased function. Business people know that. That's why I get a fair amount of business consultation work these days. So then what happens? You shift. You shift your attention. That changes again the part of the brain that's involved. Because when you shift your attention, you start using, business people love this, your executive brain. Now that is the one word. There's, there's only really one word that is fully functional in both a business context and a real neuroscience context, executive. And so that's nice. I try to take advantage of that. So you start using your executive brain when you shift your attention back to what you're supposed to be paying attention to. So that brings in this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, executive brain, and also the posterior parietal, which is thought to be involved, also from work that Rakel did, in the disengagement of attention from things that you no longer want to be paying attention to. And then when they actually are focusing their attention on what they're supposed to be focusing attention on, you just get this single activation in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And that's what you're trying to sustain as you pay attention. So that's a study. The entire study basically only took up about 12 seconds of time. She didn't even analyze the rest of the data. So you can see how clever this was. You ask people, tell us when you're aware that your mind has wandered. We'll say three seconds before that, your mind has wandered. We'll say three seconds after that, you shifted your attention. We'll say three seconds after that, your attention was focused. And it all worked out. And the reason why we know it all worked out is because the systems that she's describing here are extremely well-described neural circuits that are well known to subserve these functions. So a more than clever study, I would say. I, I consider this a landmark study. And one of the reasons why I think it's so important is because it sheds light on this subject of neurophenomenology, a big fancy word that means like the nervous system aspects of paying attention to what's actually going on. What does the brain do when we're, we're attending to the phenomena? Now, this is kind of just a, this isn't as like directly medically relevant, so I'll just go over it really fast. Um, understanding neural correlates of conscious experience, um, so the neuro is the physiological aspect. Um, but the key point here is that 
from a first person point of view. Now that gets back to the very first point I made at the very beginning of this talk. Because the part, listen carefully because this is like a take home message here. The part of this that makes the biological data never fully sufficient to describe a person. We all acknowledge biological information is very, very important. We're trying to make the case that it's never fully sufficient to, dis to really describe an actual person. Why? Because from biological information, you are never going to get real first-person point of view. To get a first-person point of view, you need to ask a person, what are you experiencing right now? And that turns out to be a very critical fact, that the biological information is very, very important, but you need a person, a real person, to have a first-person point of view. And, and mindfulness helps us see the interface between the biological data and the person data, and of course you can see why this issue of what parts of the experience do you pay attention to, why that's so important. Now we need first person information, but going all the way back to the 1800s, William James, you know, probably the father of American psychology and a lot of other stuff too, I mean William James is you know, widely acknowledged as the greatest American philosopher and the father of American psychology and all of these other terrific things. He, he put a very strong emphasis in his book, The Principles of Psychology, you know, on this first person point of view in the study of psychology. But even then, and he, and he certainly realized this too, even in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, and by the early 1900s, and behaviorism started to kick in in the 1910s. And this story is told a bit, as a matter of fact, in uh, my book, The Mind and the Brain, which is on sale at the book table out there. Um, the the, uh, the um, first person point of view is problematical in scientific research because it can be biased and inaccurate. It, you know, it, people can have different reports that can change with their experience. And how do we relate the first person information to the third person data? I mean, that's obviously one of the things we're really talking about. That's one of the reasons I think the Hassenkamp study is so, so major, because she did that. She, uh, she tied first person information to third person data. She tied brain imaging data to first person experience effectively. This is not very easy to do reliably in a reproducible manner. And, and so that's why this neurophenomenology is kind of an interesting field because it, we're, we're really, it helps us, I, I like to believe it helps us be fuller people when we actually can see what our brain is doing and really see that what we're doing with our minds, with the choices and decisions that we make about how to direct our attention is changing what our brain is doing, affects what our brain is doing. And, and when you do it regularly, and I don't have time to get into this today at all, but it's what a lot of my writing is about, you change the brain circuitry that happened in obsessive compulsive disorder, and I coined a term for that. I coined a term for that, which is, self-directed neuroplasticity. That is self-directed neuroplasticity. You make choices and decisions about how to focus your attention, and in the process of applying that and, 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 and doing the behaviors regularly, you change your brain. That's self-directed neuroplasticity. That goes for good or for bad. It's great if it's let's do mindfulness. It's bad if it's let's go to the adult store and get the next triple X rated video. So it's both, both in those cases, it's self-directed neuroplasticity, but I put a, I myself, I have to admit, I put a value judgment on that. I actually think that doing the mindfulness is more aligned with a real concept of true self than going to the adult video store and getting the triple X video. But they're both equal examples of self-directed neuroplasticity. So you can see that self-directed neuroplasticity is a two-edged sword. We have to learn how to guide what we do and guide where the attention goes um, or our brain doesn't change in very positive ways. So the goal of neurophenomenology is to obtain a richer first person data through disciplined phenomenological explorations of experience. Meditation is good for that. And we're going to finish this talk with the exercise. Um, use these original first person data 
to uncover new third-person data about the physiologic processes crucial for consciousness and attention. So that's really nice because, I mean, now we're actually saying, let's see how being aware of how our minds actually work can help us come up with testable hypotheses about what the brain is doing and learn more about the brain in that way. So you can see it doesn't all have to be from the brain to the mind. That bottom hand is important, but it's gotten like, oh, it's over the top already, enough already with it's all the brain, all right? I mean, it's now like the decisions that we make about how to focus our attention, that top hand wiring the brain, Neurophenomenology and brain imaging is a good combination for studying that. Okay, so we're going to finish right now with this exercise. Hopefully now you're all going, wow, this is going to be a way for me to master how my brain works. And it is. So this is, this is a 2,500-year-old practice um, that's used in a lot of traditions. It's actually, well, the way, actually, the way this exercise is set up, it is just about almost exactly 2,500 years old. So, so there are other traditions that are even older, which use breath awareness in somewhat different way. But so the, so the breath awareness um, object of attention is in every single, every single tradition. It's biblical. I, I promise you, I've looked. Judeo-Christian, very solid. Eastern, the, I mean, it's in every tradition. And I, I don't know very much about Islam, but I'm essentially positive. In fact, I am positive. It's in the Islamic tradition as well. So this particular exercise is doing what I just described in that Hassenkamp experiment, is it's paying attention, OK, to what? Paying attention to the feeling of the movement of the air as it goes into the nostril when you breathe in, and when you breathe out, as it goes out of the nostril. So we go, you breathe in, you, you can feel that air going in. And when you breathe out, you can feel that air going out. Now, that's like the oldest way of doing it. Uh, and also completely reasonable alternative, if it's easier, is when you breathe in, the abdomen kind of rises, and you can be aware of that. And when you breathe out, the abdomen kind of falls, and you can be aware of that. So that, that's an alternative object. So we're talking about mindfulness of an object. This, this practice is mindfulness of the object of the feeling of the movement of the air as it goes in the nostril on the in-breath and out of the nostril on the out-breath. Now, to make it easier to do, um, especially like for like beginners in a large group setting, um, I actually use a timing, because this timing actually is what kind of happens naturally if you do it for five minutes or so anyway. Um, and what that timing is is basically, it's about four seconds on an in-breath, so it's like one, two, three, one on the in-breath. And then the way I do this is one, two, three, two on the out-breath, one, two, three, three on the in-breath, one, two, three, four on the out-breath, and then you start over. And so what I'm going to do is like take us just through two simple cycles of that, and then let us do it alone for a minute. So um, sit kind of straight, not rigidly straight, but I mean like the, these instructions are like sit straight, like you're kind of paying attention. I mean, and and. Um, but, and you are paying attention, except now you're going to be paying attention to the feeling of the movement of the air as it goes in the nostril and out. And again, so much of what I've said in this talk, you will be absolutely not the least bit surprised to find out. And this is, again, another thing they don't tell you in the pop media. A big part of what the mindfulness is about is being aware of the awareness that your mind wanders. Stuff comes in, distractions come in. It's hard to hold your attention on the feeling of the movement of the air as it goes in and out of the nostril, especially when you don't have that skill set developed yet, because your executive brain isn't like completely with the program yet, right? So, so the distractions, a huge part of mindfulness is being aware of the distractions and then shifting back. So her model, you know, your mind is kind of wandering. Now you're paying attention to in and out breathing. Now you become aware when it wanders, and you shift back. You know, you bring that 
executive brain in, and then you try to stabilize it on paying attention to in and out breathing. So that's a huge part of mindfulness, being aware of when your attention has wandered. Okay, so awareness of in and out breathing. Eyes can be open, eyes can be closed. Either is fine. Closed might be a little easier, but you know, for those of you who are a little kind of on the suspicious side, keep them open, no problem. So, so um, let's get ready to go here. In, out. I'm going to start counting after one more. In, out. And then in, one, two, three, one. Out breath, one, two, three, two. In breath, one, two, three, three. Out breath, one, two, three, four. In breath. One, two, three, one. Out breath. One, two, three, two. In breath. One, two, three, three. Out breath. One, two, three, four. One minute on your own. Fifteen seconds. Okay, open your eyes and that with mindfulness practice. And that can lead us right into the question and answer period. Comments, questions, suggestions, anything you want. Oh, the floor is open for discussion and confrontation. Yes, go ahead. Is it true that the frontal brain of a male does not develop until the frontal cortex is around 25 fully developed? I wish that my frontal cortex has been fully developed for the last 38 years. Okay, so, so um, <laughs> I know this, 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 these questions are like, are, are interesting. Um, I think one way to put that is to say that we now know that there is a very significant amount of development that's happening in late adolescence and early adulthood, um, the, sort of the late teens into the early 20s. So, so the, the phraseology um, is probably closer to saying that we've really shifted forward um, the time in which the, the, the thought that the brain has reached full maturation um, has occurred. So, so it used to be thought not that long ago that, um, you know, by the er early adolescence, the brain was essentially a mature brain. And so we now really know, and a lot of us, you know, a lot of people who have adolescent kids have found out the hard way that that's not really true. So, so, um, so adolescence is really not a fully mature brain. And, and obviously that leads us <laughs> into sort of the humor of saying, so that means people in their mid-20s, they have a fully mature brain. You know, uh, we'll be waiting for, you know, full maturation is in 30s or 40s or I'm um, 62, so I'm still waiting for this full maturation to occur. So, so, I mean, I'm actually on the downward slope, let's be honest. I mean, the anomia, it's like, it's there. So, so I guess, I guess the, sh the short answer is kind of just the way I just framed it. With the period of what's getting called full maturation is really being moved forward. And I, th and I actually do think that there's kind of reasonable biological data that I don't have at my fingertips having to do with literally myelinization. So they're usually using myelinization as, as the key variable in making those kinds of statements. And it is pretty surprising when they were learning from using not fMRI, but just regular um, uh, MRI, uh, just 
not the functional part, but just the, the water MRI, that, that, that um, pruning is absolutely occurring in the cortex in, into late teens. I mean, so that, that's now known. And it wasn't known before. So that's really the source of that kind of a statement, that pruning is occurring and that myelination is still occurring. But, but you know, you got to know that 10, 15, 20 years from now, they're going to be doing this at the receptor level and the this level and the that level. So, you know, it's going to get more refined. So the whole maturation thing will move, move forward. But I think that's kind of a working answer to the question that you asked. Yes? But, oh. Over here. Oh, yeah, so the issue of the microphone. I was reminded about that, and it only took me one question and one little comment to say, make sure you go to the microphone. Make sure you go to the microphone. Okay. So I found that in the, um, my medical training, my medical practice, it often doesn't let me take the time to have any mindfulness because there's so much to do in one day, and, and I really you know, can, I can survive on four hours of sleep, and I can do all this. And what I'm realizing is I really need to recharge myself, make sure I try to get eight hours of sleep because even though we're not superhuman. And if I'm having a really busy day, taking a little, uh, just a little break for two minutes, to, it really recharges me. And what I've found and when I'm looking at other colleagues, and sometimes we're in such a bit easy day, if I'm on call up 24 hours a day, I will be more worried about my cell phone to get it recharged <laughs> rather than me. And I, I think that we all need to, I mean, you were thinking about, yes, it helps our patients, but if we can't be a, take a little time and recharge ourselves, uh, we're going to burn out uh, big time because we have so many things to complain about in medicine. But, you know, sometimes just to take the time and move on and remember why we are doing this and, and get the joy out of uh, being a physician. Um, so I, I really appreciate this. Uh, I really like that. I mean, that I could... I, I can't say that as well as you just did. So I'm just going to like, that's great. But you see, since I'm trying to make everything so pragmatic, I mean, and you just kind of brought in the aesthetic, and I, I love that because, you know, let, let, some, you know, let some lady physician who's like much more elegant than me bring in the aesthetic, right? So, so um, I'm saying, though, just like from the, you know, hardcore, like, you know, what does this really accomplish? You know, because, you know, my cell phone, I know I need. My true self, I'm not so sure I need. It's like, it is that kind of a thing. So, so I'm, say, I'm saying um, the two to three minutes a day, and I, I'm not kidding around. If you do the two to three minutes a day that we just did here, you know, five days a week, given a month, you will notice the difference. And, and if, it, if it increases your joy, as a physician, God bless you. But if all it does is increase your capacity to focus your attention better, that's enough. And, and that little amount of time on a regular basis will do that. It's a genuine exercise. It's a breathing awareness exercise. So thank you very much for framing it in that way. I appreciate that. I'm wondering if different neuroanatomies involved uh, during the focus part of your cycle that uh, you're showing in the uh, on the diagram, uh, if you're not uh, focusing on something that's more sort of autonomic, like our breathing, as opposed to maybe something we're focusing on in our okay. daily life. Well, oh, there's a huge literature on that. Um, so that, I mean, a, a big chunk of what's called cognitive neuroscience is, 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 on, is, on, is the answer to that question. And, and yeah, of, you know, of course you're right. I mean, um, but, but I will, I will say this, that, that, that the sine qua non of paying attention is, is, that, is that frontal cortex. I mean, um, and interestingly, there's a guy at Berkeley named Mark Desposito. Um, he's really a frontal cortex research person. He's really, really good. He actually gave a talk at UCLA just a couple of weeks ago. And, and um, he's, just to show like how, you know, you're really onto something there, um, he's actually now trying to sort of do the, categorize the, the executive brain, the frontal cortex anatomy. And, and, and basically he has shown, and this was published in, in neurology as, as well as other journals, um, that the frontal pole, the frontal pole is actually activated by the most abstract thoughts. So actually as the cognitive level of abstraction goes up, it moves more and more anterior. So, 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 but I'm, I'm, 
I'm essentially positive he would have no objection to saying that the frontal cortex as sort of a larger unit is, is necessary for directed attention, sustained attention, but it's absolutely right. What you're paying attention and, 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 the, and the level of cognitive complexity to what you're paying attention to absolutely changes the, 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 the fine anatomy of what gets activated. So, so this is, you know, this is, there's, like I say, cognitive neuroscience, there's a whole lot on that, and that's one name to just mention, Mark Desposito at Berkeley. Uh, first, an observation. So my mind wandered twice. I became aware of mind wandering twice during the exercise. Neither one was a uh, it's all about me kind of thing. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know if that means anything, but um, well, can I mean I don't want to like you know blow your cover here, but I mean <laughs> I mean since they weren't about you, I mean well I mean I don't know. I mean we yeah. depending on what it was about. I mean I mean if it was about like triple X rated I'm stuff, I might say, say that's not about you, but I might disagree with you on that. No, we're I mean, not going there. No, so, so, so I mean. Uh, but the question I have as I think about this, uh, when you go, first off, I mean, why does the mind wander? I mean, why hasn't that been selected out over time? And then what brings us back from mind wandering to awareness? I mean, is there a simultaneous parallel pathway going on that, that we are actually aware or we are focused, but we're not entirely focused and it snaps us back? Okay, so the guy who's done a lot of work on that, um, it's not, honestly, I really mean, I am not like, picking UC researchers here because I particularly have any predilection to UC researchers, but Desposito is at UC Berkeley, and the guy who actually has done what you're talking about is at UC Santa Barbara, and, and his name is, is Jonathan Schooler. So, but I just want to say that, that the, 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 the whole mind-wandering subject, and he, 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 he has spent like the last 10 years, he's published a couple of articles like in Trends in Cognitive, um, neuroscience, the, the, so, the, no, just trends in neuro, tins, trends in whatever. If there's ticks and there's tins, it's, I, I, forget, it's, I think it's ticks, t trends in cognitive neuroscience, schooler, S-C-H-O-L-L, -L, I think it's E-R or A-R. He's at UC Santa Barbara. And, and he, he, he's, he has studied this thing of what is mind wandering and asked this question that you just asked. So why does this happen like this? I mean, um, you know, I, I, I think he would acknowledge that it's, it's deeper than just this, but, but he, you know, as, as is very fashionable, I mean, he puts a sort of evolutionary spin on it, and, and, and he does point out that it is linked to creativity in non-trivial in non ways. So, so on one level, you don't want to draw too concrete a line between like focus is good, mind wandering is bad, and, and that, that's why this thing of being aware of where your mind is wandering to, he basically has the thesis, and I think other people have data to support this, that the people who are more aware of where their minds is mind, are wandering to make, are more prone to make creative connections, and, 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 and so being, being aware of where your mind is wandering to helps us see things that, in ways that we haven't seen them before and keeping track. And, and so then that gets into this issue of this kind of mental training being conducive to creativity, et cetera. So the adaptiveness of mind wandering is, is um, the sort of the selective advantage of mind wandering has to do with seeing things in new ways or, or seeing relevances of things that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of if you were constantly in a laser beam, you know, and, and so constantly in a laser beam isn't always good. I mean, so that's, so there's real uh, situation specificity. And that's why I think this term cognitive flexibility really is important, like making, because the executive brain is really, is really critical to cognitive frame shifting, you know, so making choices about the way you want to pay attention. So that's why I'm stressing that the awareness of when you're mind wandering has real added benefits, like, the, like what you're pointing out there. Well, okay, so that, that's, a deep, that's a great question. And, and in this, so the question is what brings you back? What snaps you back? And in this experiment, the thing that snaps you back is that you're following instructions. You see, that's the thing. I, see, that's why this first person perspective, this, see, I love this experiment on a lot of different levels. I mean, I don't think this experiment can be made sense of by this 
you know, the brain does it all you know, perspective. Because the thing that brings the attention back is the fact that the people are like wanting to bring it back. Right? I mean, you know, the instructions are like pay attention to your breathing, become aware of when you're not paying attention to your breathing, and then bring your attention back to the breathing. Now, that happens to be the way you're supposed to do this mindfulness of breathing exercise. So they're just doing a basic meditation exercise that they have a lot of experience with. And so the answer to the question, what brings it back, is their choice, their decision, their first person human decision of, because that's, I'm doing this. I'm trying to do meditation now. So you see, I mean, you see it's a really deep question, isn't it? And you can't, you can't answer that by saying, oh, their brain made them do it. I mean, and there are a lot of people who are going to go, their brain made them do it. I'm going, OK, like maybe you're a robot, but me, I'm not. I make decisions about like, whether I'm going to bring my attention back or not. And you know, so it's, it's a good question. OK. Yes. Um, you said in your book, The Mind and the Brain, you said that in stroke patients, this is talking about TBIs to the prefrontal cortex. You said in stroke patients who sustain damage to the prefrontal cortex and whose attention systems are impaired, recovery is much less likely. So is there a possibility for damage to the prefrontal cortex that, that interacts with the caudate nucleus? Can they still break habits? Is it harder to break habits? And can they utilize mindfulness if they don't have that attention? Okay, so if I was really a stroke person, I mean, I'd have more clinical, you know, clinical material, and I bet you there are people on, in this very room that we could interview and get a, a decent answer to that question, which is probably yes. But, but, but the wording, as you read it, still holds because, because it's, it's, it's less likely because it's, it's more difficult. I mean, you know, it, it's harder to pay attention when you have a frontal lesion. But it's also definitely still possible to pay attention when you have a frontal lesion. I mean, look, just lately, for what I, I've seen on TV, some of the, you know, it's, for, it's fundraising for the, the, for the injured veterans um, organization. And, you know, they, sh they show a, a, a vet with very, obviously very, he's got choreoathetoid movements and like, his, like, you know, he's got, I mean, he's got serious brain um, damage, almost, you know, we'll just assume it's from, an, you know, IED. And, and, um, and they're showing like this struggle and his wife and, you know, you know parts of it are very moving and, you know, you know, he's kissing his wife, you know, and it's like how he has to like, he's got to make a, you can see in his eyes how he's trying to make an effort to like have his lips meet her lips. It's like not trivially easy for him to do that. I mean, so there's a lot of room for like the human spirit in this. And, and um, so yes, you can pay attention and direct your attention better when you're trying to kiss your wife. It's a real good motivator. Motivation matters. So it's doable, but it's not as easy as for a guy who doesn't have that much brain damage. Thank you. A lot of the things we hear about the human mind uh, is, is done, uh, talked about in evolutionary terms in male versus female, what's been beneficial for uh, uh, human society. There's a difference between the male role and the female role. Is, is there a difference in male and female on? Uh, I'm over on this side of the, the aisle. Oh, there okay. I'm going, I'm going, boy, that guy's like a ventriloquist. He's a ventriloquist. <laughs> I'm going, nah, thanks. I appreciate that. My I'm eyesight's trying. not that good, and like, he, he I, looks like a ventriloquist. I always feel better, so, when, <laughs> I always feel right. better when you look at me <laughs> really when good. I'm talking like to you. this side, that side. I mean, I'm 62. I'll, let's call that a senior moment. All right. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, audi you, that it, audible yeah, cue did, there, that use of language. That did really you hear helped. the question? <laughs> <laughs> male, female, is there a difference in the male, female mind in this, in, in this area? Uh, and I'm, in, uh, this, in this area that we're talking about in this talk? Yeah, no, 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 there no, is not. No, no, okay, thank you. <laughs> I mean, we're talking, come on, we're talking about basic, like, this is what it is to be human, you know? I mean, th there, no, there are no gender okay, differences in the kind of things we're talking about here, no. No, there are not. OK. And anyway, being from where I'm coming from, it didn't even matter what the real answer was. That's what I was going to tell you. So, so <laughs> but that is the real answer. OK. I, I am going to talk now, okay. if that's OK. Yeah. Um, 
So my understanding from the premise of your talk is that this is something you're having patients do in order to assist with their uh, therapy for OCD or depression or any other type of disease. I was wondering if you could give us the short version of your spiel to the patient for teaching them how they're going to use this to overcome a debilitating mental illness. Okay, that, I mean, that's a really great question. And so if that gives me the opportunity to say that I do not use this breathing exercise in clinical application. I mean, I really haven't. I mean, so the, the part of this that I actually use in clinical application, I didn't even present today. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole book, Brain Lock, which is the clinical application, um, doesn't even have breathing awareness in it. Now, you or not your brain does have breathing awareness in it. So the, the take home message there is, all you have to do to train mindfulness in a, in a clinical situation is essentially all cognitive. I mean, so in principle, it's really, um, it's not different in kind than just straight ahead cognitive therapy that's as mainstream as you could possibly imagine, especially nowadays. And, and so that's my four steps of relabel, and now, now I call them relabel, reframe, refocus, you know, revalue. In the original OCD version, it was relabel, reattribute, um, refocus, revalue. So um, it's just training people to think differently about their experience. And, Honestly, I don't even, I mean, look, there's, there's, a, there's a, a bridge version of the audio. You can buy the audio version of Brain Lock, which is abridged. I think it's, I honestly think it's less than 10 bucks on audible.com because it's the short version and you'll have me giving, and it's, it's just reading the last 15, the last 15 pages of the book Brain Lock is a treatment manual. And then the audible, the audio for that book was just me reading that and that's like really cheap on Amazon.com. So it's like this stuff is easy to get. And then, and then there's a 30 minute, and there's also on my website, there's a lot of free video on my website. On my website, there's a 30 minute um, lecture I gave for the OC Foundation, which I'm the co-founder of and sort of the, I'm the American ambassador of OCD UK, which is a, the a UK charity for OCD. And so I made a video for them, which they put on YouTube um, of a, of a 30-minute talk for sufferers that I gave in England. It's on my website, or you just put OCD UK, my name, it comes up. It's got like 40,000 views or something on YouTube now. And it's exactly what you're just asking for on YouTube. Okay. Is that the last one? Oh, it's it's 131 right now. Oh, I'm, now I'm supposed to say, and we'll take more. This is what the lady, the very nice lady at the book table told me to say this at this juncture. We will be happy to take more questions at the book table when you come by, and I will be happy to sign books that she will be selling at the book table right out there after we take this last question. But why don't you kind of go out towards the book table and help that lady out out there? Okay, thank you very much. The, the concept of neuroelasticity is used in... Um, uh, theorizing how chronic pain syndromes are established and hardwired. And I, I wonder if you know of anyone who's writing and doing research on the use of mindfulness in rewiring this uh, hardwired pain syndromes for people that have just miserably suffering every day. Okay, so there's a big literature on that, and, and I have to be candid. It's not like some of these other subjects where I actually know the reference to tell you. Um, but honestly, I do know because I've done it. If you put mindfulness and chronic pain in PubMed, you will have no shortage of references, much less Google. I'm not even saying Google. I'm saying PubMed. I mean, so, so that, that, is an, that is an area of active investigation. So the answer is yes, it's going on. Like, I'm not an anesthesia person, um, but I am definitely interested in that. And the use of this kind of attention focusing is a long, as you obviously know from the way you asked that question, that this has been part of the chronic pain field for a long time. And now this kind of application has already been going at least a decade. There is a significant literature on mindfulness in the treatment of chronic pain in the medical literature. Check Thank it you. out. Thank you. Thank you.